Before I left Deadwood in Dakota Territory, I saw the beginning of winter and the end of a man. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. I had seen him several times in Deadwood, a tall, lean, almost cadaverous-looking man, wearing a black frock coat, shiny with age and trousers which were fraying at the knees. He would walk through the streets, lips moving in soundless words, seemingly oblivious of the turmoil and bustle surrounding him. It was a few days before my departure from Deadwood that I met him, and then, under rather unusual circumstances. I had gone to the gunsmith, Mr. Josiah Mellett, who was repairing some defect in my gun. Good morning, Mr. Kendall. Good morning, Mr. Mellett. Is my gun ready? Yes, sir. It was the Paul spring was mostly the trouble. I replaced the main spring, too. She was a mite on the weak side. I smoothed the action down some, like you ask. Want to see how she feels? Mm. Mm. Yes. That's very good, Mr. Mellett. Thank you. Don't see many of those double-action frontiers. Kind of new on the market. How do you like it? Very much. In good weight and quite accurate. Oh, I'll need some cartridges. Box? Two, I think. So you're pulling out of Deadwood, eh? Uh, in a couple of days. Going east? As far as the Missouri. I'll be taking the boat down to St. Louis. Uh, I'd sure like to see that old town again. It's been more than 15 years since I was there. Oh. Will there be anything else, Mr. Kendall? No, I don't think so, thank you. How much do I owe you? Well, let me see now. Oh, I purchased a gun. Yeah, be with you in a minute, mister. Please, there's no time. I must have it now. As soon as I'm through. You don't understand there's a man looking for me. He'll kill me. No, he won't. Not in here, he won't. You can see I don't allow shooting in, in my place. Not with all this black powder around. No, sir. Please. Now, now you just take it easy, mister. Uh, it, it's all right, Mr. Mellon. I don't mind waiting. Thank you, sir. <sighs> so you want a gun. What kind of a gun? It doesn't matter. Something with which I can protect myself. Uh, mister, you take my advice. You go on up to the marshal's office. Tell him what's what, and he'll give you protection. No, I wish to buy a weapon. Uh, if you're not used to shooting, it won't do you much good. Mr. Mellett's right. He's out there waiting for me now. When I leave here, he'll kill me. Who? It doesn't matter. I beg you to sell me a gun. Uh, look here, I think Mr. Mellett's idea is the best. Let me walk with you to the marshal's office. It wouldn't do any good. You don't know this man. He'll stop at nothing. Oh. I don't mind taking the chance. It's quite possible if he sees you with someone, he won't be as anxious to start shooting. Yeah, good advice, if you ask me. Mister, you're as good as dead if you try throwing lead against a man who knows guns. <laughs> you wouldn't have a chance. If you'll just wait a moment while I load. Uh, well, uh, three dollars will about do it, Mr. Kendall. Mm, right. Sure hope you have a nice trip. You come back this way, stop by. Mm, yes, I will. Well, smells like we're going to have an early winter. You won't be missing much if we do. It surely can whistle up a mean freeze around here. Yes, I've heard. There. Uh, three dollars? Yeah, that's right. All right. There. Much obliged. Thank you, Mr. Millet. You uh, know where the marshal's office is at? Yes, thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Millet. Uh, don't mind if I watch from the door, do you? No, not at all. See him? Yes. Across the street. Ah. Yes. So long. Uh, thanks again, Mr. Mellon. Do you mind my asking why he wants to kill you? It's a thing that happened some years ago, a private matter. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Yorby. Thomas Yorby. I'm Yorby. Very grateful to you, Mr. Kendall, isn't it? Yes. 
The marshal can't help me. Nobody can. Sooner or later he'll do it. He'll find me, kill me. He swore he would. Uh, slow down, Mr. Yorby. He's crossing over. Now listen to me. If he starts shooting, lie down. Morning, preacher. Said your prayers today. What do you want? What do you think? You mind standing to one side, mister? I've come a long way to kill this fella. He's not armed. Doesn't matter, none. Get out of the way. I don't like murder. Me neither. But shooting the preacher ain't murder. It's a kindness. Well, I hate to meddle in a private affair, but Mr. Yorby asked for protection. I feel bound to see him safely to the marshal's office. I got no quarrel with you. Nor I with you. But I'm not letting you shoot an unarmed man. I won't take no chances swapping shots with you, mister. You might just be good enough to beat me. I got too much to live for. You're lucky, preacher. You're lucky you talked this fellow into helping you. But he better stay almighty close to your side, because when you're alone, I'm coming looking for you. And next time, I'll get you. Corporation. The cars that can do, in 59, that can do what they look like they can do. They're the cars of the forward look. 59, they can do more than other cars can do. For you, drive the cars that can do. Drive the cars that can do. Plymouth? Can do. Dodge? Can do. DeSoto? Can do. Chrysler? Can do. Imperial? Can do. The cars that can do, in 59, that can do what they look like, they can do. They're the cars of the forward look. 59, they can do more than other cars can do. For you. See the new Plymouth and the new Dodge at your dealers now. See the new DeSoto, Chrysler, and Imperial Friday, October 24th. The cars that can do. For you. The stranger was a man of somewhat slight stature, hair graying. As he walked away, I noticed that he had a limp. Then he disappeared into a saloon. My companion, Thomas Yorby, passed a shaking hand across his face. It would have been better to have had done with it. Let him kill you? I'm tired, Mr. Kendall. He'll keep his word. There'll be no rest, no peace for either of us. Let the marshal take care of it. No, it's useless. He can't arrest the man for something he hasn't yet done. Mm, but what are you going to do? Wait for him to find me again. Why not leave Deadwood? Go somewhere else. It would be the same wherever I went. He'll follow. Sooner or later, he'll find me. Uh, listen to me, Mr. Yorby. I don't know what you've done, but I shan't sleep very well at night unless I do my best to see you're not murdered. I shall be leaving myself in a couple of days. If you wish, you can share my hotel room and travel with me to Fort Pier. You have no reason to do this. For all you know, he may have every right to want to kill me. That's possible. But in the meantime, we better get you off the street before he changes his mind and shoots us both in the back. I thought you were asleep. No. Mr. Yorby, there's one thing I should like to know. That man called you preacher. Are you a, a minister? I was. Oh. His name is Boyd Greer. I married his sister. She died in Hayes City. He blamed me for it. That was five years ago. And you say you were a minister? After the death of my wife, I could no longer preach the gospel. When she was lost to me, I lost faith. I cared about nothing. And why does Greer blame you? He was against my taking her to Hayes. 
It was a rough town. I wanted to preach there. She insisted on going with me. There was trouble, the shooting. She died. And he blamed you for that, ma'am? After her death, I left Hayes, wandering, finding enough work to keep myself alive. But wherever I went, always the knowledge that he was looking for me. Now he's found me. Hmm. And there's nothing else? Huh? Yes. It's the thing that keeps me from sleeping in the night. The knowledge that the shooting could have been prevented. How did she die? Years ago, there was a young man who had come out of the war knowing only how to kill. He joined other young men who had the same emptiness of purpose. They drifted to Arizona Territory and on north into Kansas. The young man was called the Torigo Kid. He knew how to use a gun. The others followed him. Then one day, one day he heard an old man, a preacher. He heard the words, and he knew that his life was meaningless. He threw away the gun. He swore never to use it again. He studied with that old man, and he learned about good. He became a preacher and met a woman who loved him. You were the Torigo kid. In Hayes City, I was with my wife preaching in a saloon. She had a sweet voice, sang the hymns. Then somebody recognized me. There were words. <laughs> it happened so quickly. A, a, a gun was put into my hand, and there was shooting. When it was finished, the man who knew me was dead, and she was dead, too. I threw down the gun and ran away. Does Greer know about the Torigo kid? He found out. When you came to the gunsmith shop to buy a gun... You were going to kill him? I couldn't. I knew I couldn't. That's why I let you talk me out of it. If you had a gun? He would be dead now. I'd rather die myself than that. Stay here. Where are you going? To find Greer. He won't listen to you. Why should he? I don't know, but he might. It's better if I face him myself alone and stop running. I've sinned. I used to think that turning to the Bible would cleanse me, but how could it? I have yet to complete payment for my sins. Perhaps my death will be an atonement. I don't think so. Will you stay in the room? All right, Mr. Kendall. I'll stay. I left the hotel and walked back to Main Street to where I'd seen Greer go into the saloon. I found him there, sitting at a table in a dark corner... Staring moodily into a glass of whiskey. Is he hiring guns now? No. I came to talk. I have nothing to say to you. Are you drunk? No. I can't get drunk. If you kill him, will it bring back your sister? She'll rest easy. Will you? He lied. Coming into the house, that oily tongue, preaching about God, and all the time knowing what he'd been, what he was. A man can change. Not him. My sister was a nice girl. Pretty. She could have married a decent man, had kids. She could be alive today. He killed her as sure as if he shot her himself. Taking her to haze, throwing lead. Yes, he told me about it. Maybe he wasn't to blame. You finished what you come to say? He was going to buy a gun and shoot it out with you. He didn't. Gun shy. No. He says he could kill you in a gunfight. I'm, I'm inclined to believe that he could. You'll never get the chance. Seems to me you're taking a lot on yourself, sitting in judgment. There isn't anybody else to do it. The law won't. The law might be more just. The law is wrong. And what does the law say about a man who kills in cold blood? It's execution. There's a difference. All right. Now I'll tell you something. I don't think you'll do it. Don't you push me too hard, mister. I might take my chances with you first. I'll make it easy for you. He's in my hotel room. I'll take you there. I won't interfere. If you think you can pull the trigger, do so. I say you won't, because you know it'll be murder, and they'll hang you for it. <laughs> you lead the way, mister. <laughs> Of all leading filters, cigarettes can't filter death, can't filter death. It makes good sense. 
when you smoke Kent, Kent filters best of all of the brands of cigarettes. Kent tastes the best, Kent tastes the best, a richer taste than all the rest. Kent filters best. The sky was overcast as we walked up the main street of Deadwood to the hotel. There was a chill in the air and the steep slopes on either side of the road closed in over us. Oppressive. Dark. After talking to Greer, seeing him, I had reasoned that in my presence he would not kill his brother-in-law, even if given the chance. It was a risk. But the risk of allowing the two men to meet alone was greater. We walked down the shadowy hallway to my room. Where is he? Well, I left him here. You make a move for your gun, mister, and I'll kill you. You and the preacher, mighty fancy play you're making. There's no trick. I thought he'd be here. Maybe he stepped out, huh? Then he'll come in and plug me in the back. All right. Just wait. When he shows his face in that door, I'm going to blow it off for him. We waited. Ten minutes. Twenty an hour. There was no sound. Through the window, I could see a few flakes of snow drifting down through the trees. It was cold in the room. Then I heard steps outside in the hallway. Greer heard them, too. Motioned to me for silence. Come on in, preacher. Let me think. I've been sitting here kind of savoring the time when you'd come through that door and I'd put a bullet in your head. Now you're here, I want to watch your face. I want to hear you howl before I do it. Your pal. He figured to get me in here so you and him could finish me off, huh? Shoot. Get it over with. No hurry. No hurry at all. Where you been? I went down to the stage station. But I knew I could never run far enough. So I came back. Where you want it, preacher? If it'll give you pleasure, shoot me where it'll hurt. So you can hear me scream. It hurt when she was killed. Why shouldn't it hurt you? Don't talk anymore. Do it and let me go in peace. There won't be any peace for you. Not even when you're dead. You can't have any power over that, boy. You shut that dirty mouth of yours, you hear? I'm not afraid now. I know the wrongs I've done. I know it was my fault she died, so go on. Shoot! Shoot! Shut up! You hear me? I won't listen to that stinking, greasy lip of yours like preaching to me, you hear? Just know this one thing, Boyd. I could have killed you if I'd wanted to carry a gun. I didn't. I don't have to listen anymore. Now shoot or get out! Next one, I don't miss. I've had enough of this. You get back where you belong. Put away the gun or I'm going to take it from you. I'm telling you. Put it away. All this time. All this time. Wasted time. I've wanted to kill him. Couldn't think of nothing else. Listen to me, boy. I'll never be able to forget. I loved her. Because of me, she's dead. I think I'm sorry you didn't shoot me. Then I wouldn't have to remember. Then then that's good. That's a good thing. Mister, I'm obliged to you. I'm much obliged. I ain't looking for you no more, preacher. 
You walk alone now. And you remember my sister. You remember what you've done to her. Thomas Yorby stood looking at the door for a moment. Then, without a word, he opened it and went out. I watched from my window and saw the tall figure with head bent go out into the cold street. Threadbare, shiny coat. He walked away and was lost in a swirl of snowflakes. If it's new, Plymouth got it. Got it. The 59 Plymouth got it if it's new. If it's new, if it's new. The 59 Plymouth is at your Plymouth dealers now. It's new, it's wonderful, and it's here. New styling to make your heart sing. Plymouth for 59 has that fine car look. New Fury models at new lower prices. New swivel seats. Swing you in when you enter. Swing you out when you leave. New push-button heater, world's simplest temperature control. New Golden Commando V8, biggest engine in the low-price field. New Miramatic mirror, new automatic headlight dimmer, new sport deck, new everything. See the completely new 59 Plymouth. Drive the completely new 59 Plymouth at your Plymouth dealers now. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Waldo Epperson, Richard Perkins, and Ray Wood. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Bud Sewell speaking. <laughs>